Would you please welcome Professor Lord Layard. Uh, he's an economist who, uh, as he put it just now to me, has seen the error of his ways. And he's now working on uh, happiness and uh, mental health. He has been instrumental uh, in the expansion of psychological uh, therapies within the NHS. And he's the co-founder of Action for Happiness. And you'll see there's a little leaflet on every other seat. Uh, take a look at the little leaflet. I'm sure uh, Richard will be talking about this. We have Richard's books available at the back of the hall, his book on happiness, and his uh, more recent uh, volume called Thrive, uh, which is a hardback. That's available at the back of the hall, too. So please welcome uh, Professor Lord Richard Layard. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Um, I thought I would start with uh, an illuminating story from when we appointed the first director of Action for Happiness. And one of the candidates had gone into the web very intelligently to see was there any other organization that had the word happiness in its title? And the answer that came back on his computer was, your search for happiness has produced no results. <laughs> well, uh, I, I want to talk about how we can do better than that. <laughs> um, because, uh, well, I, I, I assume that all of you think happiness matters, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, and I have actually believed ever since I was a, a student uh, that the best state of uh, human affairs is where uh, there's the most happiness uh, and the least misery. I think that is the most powerful idea uh, of the last 300 years. That it's really that idea uh, which more than any other uh, brought mankind or Western uh, uh, mankind out of the age of superstition to one where we judge our uh, situation by how we experience it rather than by some uh, imposed criterion. But I think this idea uh, is often misunderstood so I wanted to arm you, if, if you're not already armed, with a, an answer or two to the critics. The critics will say uh, that assumes that the only thing uh, that individuals want is their own happiness. Um, well, of course, it doesn't assume that, because we wouldn't have a very happy society if the only thing that people wanted was their own happiness and the only thing they pursued was their own happiness. It's not that that's being said. It's being said, don't start with the individual, as I'm afraid too much philosophy does, and then ask, you know, what is the good life? And then you get into a frightful ethical muddle. Start with the society, like Aristotle did, and then ask what would be uh, a good situation for a society, and then say, well, uh, what would be good was, would be the quality of life as people experience it. It would be, ultimately, their inner experience, uh, which was how we would judge the state of affairs. Um, but, of course, we wouldn't have a good state of affairs with a lot of people enjoying life and few people miserable uh, if people didn't uh, take actions to promote the happiness of other people uh, as well as themselves. And I think this is, this is an absolutely crucial answer that we have to people who say that uh, the movement which is promoting happiness is promoting selfishness. It's not. It's quite the opposite. It's promoting uh, action-oriented to the happiness of others uh, as well as oneself. So I think that from that principle... Uh, that a good state of affairs is one where there's the most happiness and least misery, you can straight away uh, answer all the questions of political and moral philosophy. <laughs> um, so, question of moral philosophy, how should we live? Well, we should live so as to produce as much happiness in the world as we can uh, and as little misery. Uh, how should we organise our, our political life? We should uh, pursue policies and institutions uh, which will create the conditions for, uh, again, the most happiness uh, and the least misery. And if we were here 300 years ago, this would have been co absolutely commonplace. This would be assumed in all the uh, um, forward-thinking members of London society at that time, also of society in Edinburgh, of obviously where the idea came from 
more than anywhere else, also uh, in uh, Virginia, <laughs> in, in the United States, uh, and, and in parts of, of the continent. For example, Jefferson uh, said um, that the only legitimate objective of government is to promote uh, the life and happiness of the people. I think that's an extraordinarily sensible remark. Can you think of any other reason uh, for having government? I can't think of any other reason for having government. So, very powerful idea. Um, did a lot of good in the succeeding century. Uh, I would say a great deal of the social reforms of the 19th century um, and many of the 20th century were impelled by it. But the idea, unfortunately, fell out of fashion at the beginning of the 20th century uh, because the psychologists, who in a sense are the custodians of the idea, decided that you couldn't know whether somebody was happy or not. <laughs> um, and uh, unfortunately, my profession, the economists, followed. Uh, they had believed that the aim of economics was ultimately to think about the creating conditions for uh, happy living, uh, but they followed the psychologists in the 20th century with the view that you couldn't tell how happy somebody was, which meant, of course, that you couldn't even think about inequality because you couldn't compare the well-being of one person with another. Uh, so what were you left with? The only thing you could look at was the total... GDP. So we had this abysmal and really appalling idea that the way to measure the welfare of a society uh, was by its GDP, which is still rife, uh, and um, it's absolutely time that we got rid of it. Now, our, our great uh, aid in this, of course, is the new science of happiness, because the psychologists have changed their mind, and they now do think uh, you can measure uh, how happy another person is. And, of course, one of the first findings of this was that if you took the measurements, uh, you found that in many of the main countries of the world, uh, happiness had not risen in spite of huge increases in GDP. So in America, we have measurements from the 1950s, no rise in happiness. In West Germany, we have measurements from the 1970s, no rise in happiness. In China, we have measurements from 1990, uh, no rise in happiness. I mean, these are extraordinarily challenging findings uh, for economists and indeed for, for everybody who, who subscribes to the view that the uh, answer to the problems of life is to uh, become richer. This has had a big impact um, at the policy level, at least. Um, the OECD has run a series of conferences on what is progress. Uh, and they now have promoted the measurements which we uh, persuaded the British government to adopt. There are four measurements uh, uh, that you might know of uh, the happiness of the people which are done on a regular basis every year uh, for the last three years now. The OECD have picked those up and they've now persuaded uh, almost every member country of the OECD uh, to do it. The EU is doing it. Uh, the phrase that the EU uses is beyond GDP. But one of the most, well, one of the most <laughs> readable, and I, I think probably the sort of nearest that there is to a Bible, if you want to go off and look at anything to do with happiness and public policy, um, is a report called Wellbeing and Policy that was produced uh, by a committee chaired by Gus O'Donnell. He's a very interesting man who was the cabinet secretary. Um, and even when he was there, was trying to push well-being uh, to some extent uh, within Whitehall. But he is now campaigning for that more than anything else uh, in his life. And I, I recommend that report, um, which you, well, you could, I was a member of the committee. You could find it uh, on my website or the Legatum Institute website, uh, saying that you know, the object of a government should be <laughs> not to make the country wealthy, but to make the country happy, uh, and in particular, of course, to uh, prevent misery. So I do think that although we have been, happiness has been flat for the last uh, 50 years or so, 
<coughs> as far as we know, uh, in, in many countries, uh, we can do better, and we've got to get on to some new and higher plateau, and that's what I want to talk about. So let me talk first a bit about the findings of the new science, and then about the implications for public policy, and then implications for us and, and how, how we, uh, we live ourselves. Okay, so obviously you can't have science without measurement. Uh, and uh, you can measure how happy somebody is by asking them. Uh, that's how we normally find things out about other people. And uh, you can ask them different questions, of course, how satisfied they are with their lives and so on. There's a range of questions. But the issue is, of course, uh, do the answers convey any information? Uh, do people use the words in the same way or whatever? And I'll give you four reasons for thinking that there is a serious amount of information in the way people report their happiness. Uh, first, um, if, if I'm the subject of the study, uh, we can ask Stephen, uh, assuming he knew me a bit better than he does, <laughs> how happy I am. And there's quite a strong correlation. Actually, it's difficult to imagine how you could have a human society in which people didn't know something about what was going on in each other's uh, inner uh, state of feeling. Second, uh, if you get these measurements across a whole lot of people, uh, you will find that they are quite well correlated with things you would expect to influence their happiness. Thirdly, uh, if you again get these measurements, you will find they are quite good at predicting uh, what the person will do um, and fourth, what really impressed me, and I would never have come into this or written the blue book you'll find at the back um, if, if I hadn't read this, uh, the, the neuroscientists have found areas in the brain where, if you measure the electrical activity in the brain, it is correlated with what people say in response to questions uh, about happiness. So no, nobody could argue that the electrical measurements are not objective, so that our feelings are objective phenomena. They are actually the most important objective phenomena for human beings, <coughs> how we feel. So armed with this information uh, uh, about uh, what people feel by asking them, uh, what can we say about what causes it? Well, uh, the ob obvious way to, to start on this is to simply find out lots of other things about <laughs> the same group of people and see what factors most influence uh, whether people say they're happy or how happy they are on a scale uh, of 0 to 10. Uh, and since I'm an ec economist, let's start with income. Uh, income is correlated with happiness, but it's a tiny fraction of the variation of happiness in this, ha in this room is accounted for by the variation across people in how well off they are. And the same is true across the whole population. In fact, guess what the fraction is? Any, any guesses? One percent. Good guess, though. Thank you. Uh, One percent of the variation of happiness in, in a, in the population of every country in the world, even the poorest countries, actually, uh, is explained by, the, by the, the, uh, the, the income of the individual concerned. Um, whereas we can explain about 20, 25% of the variation. Um, so uh, before I come on to the, the really important things, I want to make one other point uh, about income. Because it is true that uh, richer people are happier, other things equal, than poorer people. So why, over time, uh, have we not got richer, uh, got happier as we've got richer? And uh, this is a very important concept that I'm about to mention. The reason is that people are comparing their income with some norm, with the general living standards. So people who have an income above average are somewhat happier than people who have a an income below, uh, below the average. But of course, as the average goes up, uh, the happiness which is generated by the extra income uh, uh, doesn't arise because the uh, standard of comparison 
is going up at the same time as fast as the actual uh, income that people have. Um, and and the, the, there's a very important point that comes from this. Uh, if somebody is trying to make themselves be happier by making themselves better off, they're, they're only succeeding insofar as they become relatively richer than somebody else. So as they go up, the other person goes down. So, so this is a zero-sum game when people are trying to make themselves uh, happier by becoming richer. And I think uh, that perhaps, perhaps the, the most, in a sense, the most important thing I want to say today, that the, the idea that, that getting on um, and encouraging our children to get ahead, to do better than other people, the idea that that is the way to produce a better society is, is absolutely fallacious. And you can see it's a sim simple fallacy because it, so, you know, somebody's trying to climb higher up the ladder th than other people. Well, there's only so many places on the ladder. If one person goes up, somebody else is going down. It is a zero-sum game. It is an appalling objective for society. And yet... Well, when I worked in the Department of Education, which I did for four years, there was a huge poster, actually two huge posters, uh, which said getting ahead. But getting ahead is the, the object of education. Well, I mean, this is absolutely hopeless, obviously. We can't uh, get a happier society by having everybody trying to get ahead of everybody else. Um, so, so, so let's abandon that and find out what things we can do, which are not zero-sum games, but positive sum games. And fortunately, when we study happiness, you will find that you quickly see what the positive sum games are, because on the external side of life, let's divide our sort of, uh, what hap uh, the sources of our feelings into two. Things uh, about the world outside us and things inside us. The, th the things outside us that really matter to us are our relationships, our human relationships. In every country in the world, the, the, the most important external factor is your close personal relationships in the family or uh, with your partner or whoever. Um, that is number one. Number two is your relationships at work. If, if you want work, do you have it? If you are in work, uh, are you enjoying the people uh, that you work with or are you being bullied, as so often happens in our modern uh, macho culture? And then third, relationships in the community. Do you feel safe? Do you feel other people are on your side? For example, uh, one of the most interesting questions, let's find out your answer to this. One of the most interesting questions that's been asked uh, many times in many countries is, do you think most other people can be trusted? Do you, or that you can't be too careful? So why don't we find out how people answer that here? Do you think most other people can be trusted? Yes. And who says no? Be, be brave. A few more hands, please. <laughs> well, you see, th this is fascinating. Because it shows what, uh, it either shows how nice you all are, uh, or it shows how lucky you all are. <laughs> because uh, the answer to that question in Britain, the proportion who say yes is not 95% as here, but 30%. Uh, the same is true in, in America. It used to be higher. It used to be 60% in both Britain and America, but uh, now it's fallen to 30% as we've encouraged this competitive culture. It's still in Scandinavia where they haven't uh, gone the same way and, and do stress the common uh, elements that bind people rather than the things which make them different. Um, it's still 60-70% uh, in Scandinavia, and that's, of course, one important clue to how we can get a happier society. But I'll come back to that. Let me just go on with some facts. So that's the, the external uh, realm. Then, of course, also very important for our happiness is what's going on inside us, uh, whether our physical health is good, um, but even more important, whether our mental health is good, and I've spent a lot of time in the last few years uh, trying to do these uh, statistical analyses for uh, at least four countries uh, to see what uh, 
are the most, most powerful factors that explain this variation of happiness across people. Uh, and everywhere, I find the single most important factor uh, is mental health. Um, much more important, for example, uh, in Britain now in explaining uh, who the most miserable people are, uh, you, you will find that some of that is explained by poverty and some of that is explained by unemployment. But by far the largest number of miserable people are miserable because of mental illness not related to either poverty or unemployment. So, I mean, I'm a, a member of the Labour Party, um, but I'm very keen to persuade the left that, that you, we must have a wider concept of deprivation. In fact, I think actually one of the reasons why politicians are not connecting with the public is they don't appreciate what things actually really matter in people's daily lives. Mental illness is a daily problem in at least a third or half of the countries, of, of the uh, families in this country. Uh, and, and if only politicians would take more interest, it would help. I'll tell you one other interesting fact that's relevant to education. If you want to predict whether a person, when they're an adult, will be satisfied with their life, you can look at various features of their childhood. Uh, for example, you can look at their academic attainment, you can look at their behaviour, and you can look at their emotional health, measured in, in, in a standard kind of way. Which of those three would you think is the best predictor of whether a person be satisfied with their life as an adult? <laughs> I more or less set that up, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Emotional health is number one. Behaviour number two. Academic achievement, the least least important. And incidentally, of course, uh, good emotional health, other things equal, is good for academic achievement. It's not an alternative, as I think Michael Gove uh, thinks. Um, so, let me move on to public policy. Um, if we want to make a happier world, what are some of the absolutely obvious things uh, we have to do. So I would say, number one, particularly since I spent my time working on it the last five years, improve treatment for people suffering from mental health problems. Improve treatment, because I think it, the moral obligation to deal with the person who is suffering out there in front of you is overwhelming and much stronger than the moral obligation to try and prevent anything. And I'll come to that in a second. But the moral obligation uh, on the health service to treat mental illness as seriously as it treats physical illness seems to me absolutely overwhelming. It's a simple matter of human rights, if you like. Um, mental illness, believe it or not, uh, is, it's not only the main illness of people of working age, uh, it, it actually accounts for over 50% of all illness uh, under the age of 45. Um, so the economics go the same way uh, as the ethics that I was talking about before. Uh, and this service which we've been building up in the health service called Improving Access to Psychological Therapy, IAPT, um, has, uh, you can pretty clearly show this, um, has cost nothing because it saved as much money but through people being on, on uh, incapacity benefits and so on as its uh, cost. Uh, and incidentally, of course, mental health also affects physical health. So um, there are big savings uh, on the physical part of the NHS when people recover from mental illness. Um, and uh, there, there, there is an anti-stigma campaign, which I'm not sure is hugely effective. But I actually think that the main thing which will deal with the stigma problem is the fact that we now have treatments uh, which work. I think what was so, so stigmatising was the feeling that uh, nothing could be done about it. Um, and that's why people didn't want to talk about it. Uh, once something... Once you know something can be done about it, you begin to talk about it, as people have begun to talk about cancer, for example. 
Um, so uh, I'm not saying there's any relation between one and the other, but I think we need a massive change in public attitude, much more openness. This is a fact of life. We should be able to discuss it just like we discuss anything else. Let me move on to prevention. Because, of course, we should try and prevent things uh, uh, as well as deal with them when they occur. And I think the main lever... Which, well, I think we should, of course, have more uh, courses available to parents and more support for parents. But the biggest single uh, social lever, if you like, that we have is in the schools because of the time uh, that children spend there. Uh, I, I said that I think the value system in schools has to be completely changed uh, from uh, you are here to do the best you can for yourself compared with everybody else to you are here in order to learn how to be useful uh, to other people. I mean, that is, is such an absolutely key thing. Of course, you should be interested in the thing for its own sake, but you should be motivated partly by the fact that uh, if you're learning some science or uh, <clears throat> some culture or whatever, it's uh, to enable you uh, to be of service to others as well. So we need a new ethos in schools. Uh, of course, a lot of schools, some schools are much better than this than others, and I, one has to be really careful in preaching to teachers. I'm sure there's some teachers here who are doing great, great work. Um, but the first thing is to get the right ethos in the school and have it inform uh, all the assemblies and so on in the school. But the second, of course, is to have re really good teaching of life skills running right through uh, the school curriculum. And again, it's like the treatment of mental illness. We are now in a position where we have evidence-based um, ways of teaching children uh, ab about managing their own feelings, managing their relationships, uh, developing empathy, uh, 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 avoiding... Um, the things that they ought to be avoiding, um, thinking about um, what it would be like to become a parent, parenting should be taught in schools, and so on. Uh, and of course, the whole school should be much more mentally health conscious. All teachers should be taught about mental health and what to do if they see a child who is struggling. I could go through a whole list of uh, other things, but th those are two obvious areas, mental health and education. But what we need to get this really uh, pervading the whole of public policy is a framework for thinking about how do you make public policy in a way where the object is not to show that the country will become wealthy and it's good for the economy, whoever that is, um, but that it's good for people um, and for their uh, happiness. So, in this report, which I'm keep keeping on selling to you, the Wellbeing and Public Policy Report, <laughs> um, we, we, have a, we lay out you know, how you would move from the current public policy, which is meant to be based on so-called cost-benefit evaluation, cost-benefit analysis, where the units of benefit, in which you, units in which you measure benefits or money, move to the one where you, the units in which you measure benefits are, are happiness. So let me just end now with individuals, us. <laughs> um, I think if we want to be happier, we obviously should know uh, what makes us happy <laughs> as individuals. Um, but we also, uh, if we want to make society happier, we should uh, know what makes other people happier and how we can contribute uh, to that. Uh, and. I think that there's a very important truth, which I'm sure you've <laughs> heard too many times, but uh, there is now quite a lot of good neuroscientific evidence that when you make somebody else happy, uh, you also make yourself happier. So that the idea that we should be going for a more altruistic society is not that we should be going for a more hair shirt society. It's going for a society where we shift more of our motivation towards helping other people, uh, but we actually get pleasure from uh, doing that as well. And, you know, there are these findings in neuroscience when they set people up in the lab and you do the cooperative uh, act in the game in the lab and then they, 
lo and behold, the bit, the bit of your brain that lights up is the, the same reward centre as lights up when you eat chocolate or whatever else rewards you. Um, so we, we, we want a culture which takes into account, it's oriented towards taking into account how people actually feel um, more than anything else. Um, and that's, that's why we founded this, this movement. So I just want to say a little bit about this, and then, then we can uh, chat. Um, th this movement is called Action for Happiness. Uh, we launched it nearly four years ago to try and promote uh, a more uh, altruistic but also uh, healthy uh, society in the sense that people had regard to their, their own uh, well-being uh, in a way which was realistic as well as to the uh, well-being of others. Um, and the, the, the thing that characterised it was the pledge. Uh, when you join this movement, uh, which you can do by going into the web, um, you are asked whether you'd like to make a pledge uh, to uh, try in your life to uh, create as much happiness in the world uh, around you as you can. Uh, and as little misery. That's the that's the pledge. Uh, so we have we have 36,000 people who've joined and made this pledge. We have about a quarter of a million people following, and uh, people love the website. I know nothing about websites, um, but everybody tells me it's wonderful. So do go into it. In it, some of the things you'll find in there are, are for example, these 10 keys to happier living uh, on the back of your sheet and evidence. Uh, that uh, they do indeed uh, make a huge difference. Um, and then you'll find all kinds of actions, again, for which there's evidence <coughs> that are, will contribute to uh, the realising of different parts of this, this dream. Um, so that's uh, the movement as it has been so far, more or less web-based. But we're now moving into a different phase uh, which we're going to actually launch with the Dalai Lama uh, on September the 21st, next, next, uh, next year, put in your diary, afternoon of September the 21st. Um, and th that is um, the formation of groups. So this becomes a face-to-face -face movement as well. And the way the groups are going to get started, if that's what they want, um, is by taking uh, a course called Exploring What Matters, which is eight meetings, to our meetings uh, in a row, for which materials are provided um, and the sort of set uh, format. So it's a sort of structured uh, uh, and uplifting and informing uh, event at which people can also form relationships with other people, uh, which can be supporting and inspiring uh, as the time goes on and the groups would then continue after these initial meetings. Um, if anybody's interested in being a facilitator of one of these groups, um, please, please grab me as I go out of the door, <laughs> uh, or go into the website and, and enlist. There's a training course is being put on for these facilitators. Um, so uh, help us to get this movement for secular, um, inspiring people um, joyfully to uh, promote a, a, a better world on a, on a secular basis, uh, kind of a movement uh, going on the ground uh, in this country. Um, as I say, this is not a, a hair shirt movement. We don't want a hair shirt movement. We want a movement where people enjoy uh, doing good. Um, uh, and I, I'm I think of that as the opposite of Puritanism. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the, the definition of Puritanism by the American writer H.L. Mencken, uh, which says, Puritanism, the dreadful fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. <laughs> uh, that's not what we're about. Uh, let, let's all be happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Um, so, 
put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Um, and just wait for the microphone to, to come to you. I'm going to, I'm going to start with this um, lady over here. Um, first of all, thank you very much for participating in the IAPT uh, project, which gave therapy to millions of people. I don't know what people before that did. Um, but I'm more interested in the prevention that you spoke about, which is at schools. Because I think that if we taught kids at schools um, emotional intelligence, mental health, relationships, assertiveness, we can prevent a lot of divorces in the future, a lot of people going to prison because of aggression. Why isn't a lot done at schools? Because I think that IAPT, or what you did, is the second phase only. Yes. Um, Freud wrote a hundred years ago that we are teaching kids a lot of rubbish that they forget when they leave school and the most important things we are not teaching them. So the idea is really old. So we have as humans a body and a mind. So things could go wrong in the body, they could go wrong in the mind. We teach kids biology, biology, biology. I'm not against that. We are not teaching them about the mind, which is part of us. And I think that the big push, the big effort, and the big money should start from children. And then they will be fine as adults. Uh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I hope everybody else does too. I just mentioned one thing we're doing about this. Um, I mean, these issues are ones uh, that many teachers find quite difficult to talk about. Um, it involves a, a degree of, uh, of self-exposure when you start talking about the emotions with children. And I, I think that what we've got to do, of course, is to train teachers uh, to be able to, to do this. So there should be an element of training for all teachers uh, in basic emotional intelligence and, and a way of communicating with children, plus... We, 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 need, we do need dedicated time in the curriculum uh, for uh, teaching these things in a, in a professional way. Uh, I, I do believe that it's possible to do a lot of things which you think are doing good without them having any effect. Um, there, there was a, 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 as you know, the, the Labour government introduced the programme called SEAL, Social and Emotional Aspects of Learning. Um, the primary one was not really evaluated uh, in any uh, professional way. The secondary one was, and was found to have no effect. So we've got to be careful. Uh, I don't mean any harm was done, but the no, no good was done. We've got to do it professionally. And uh, we have had somebody look throughout the world, actually, for those programmes which have been really evaluated properly. And... Um, co are combining them into a programme which we call Healthy Minds, which is, covers uh, years uh, 7, 8, 9 and 10 in secondary schools, one hour a week, and is being trialled in 34 schools at, at, at the moment. This is the sort of way we've got to go, and we've got to have some people, uh, t teachers who, who are being trained, uh, to be specialists in this area. I, I, I think... You know, we need some missionaries in schools. I think we've got, got some more psychologically conscious uh, people uh, going into schools. Uh, this would be uh, a, a, another really important part of building a happier society. But, I mean, another thing I do think is actually we should measure the mental health of children. You know, when, when a child goes to school, they have a physical examination. And they take no, there's no screening for their mental health at all. Um, you talked a lot about mental health, and I'm, I'm interested in how in your world of thought you see mania and the feeling of elation in mania, and if you would contrast that to happiness. Uh, 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 I mean, obviously, uh, um, I mean, mania can be dangerous to other people. Uh, <laughs> Uh, doesn't on the whole last long because most people who experience mania then experience depression uh, 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 later. And the way we have to think of uh, what we would like is a situation where we take into account, you know, the whole of a person's life. So it's, it's not we don't just focus. When I say we want people to be happy, I don't mean we just want people to have a few highs. We, we're interested in the, the, the general tenor of, of the, their whole life, of course, averaged.
Thank you for that. Um, I've got actually two questions. Can you stand One, up? Perhaps sorry. your questioner. I am stood up. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's an old joke, but it but, works. Uh, but okay. All the others as well, please. <laughs> so I've got two questions. The first is uh, this gentleman was talking about mental illness and stigma. I was wondering what element of that is about fear. If somebody breaks their leg, we don't assume they're going to kick us to death with the other one. If somebody has got a mental illness, they don't know what we're capable of doing because of the mental illness. So I wonder what element you th if you think that fear is part of that stigma, that we don't know what's going to happen. And the second part is you were talking about happiness. How, what, if anything, do you think is the attitude we bring to everything we do? And an example I'll give you, I have two friends who've just been given we can't do any more for you diagnosis. One of them is sitting in a chair crying, and so is everybody around her. The other one, up, out, brilliant scarves, stilettos and full makeup, and she's going to do it right till the end. So I wonder what element of the attitude you bring to happiness or to life is impacts on the happiness that you give and you feel. I mean, on your second point, of course, the, the at, your basic attitudes are incredibly powerful determinants uh, of how you feel in any given context. And, you know, the quotation that I, I love, you know, the, do you know the book by Viktor Frankl called, uh, what's it called, Man's Search for Meaning, I think it's called. Um, he was in Auschwitz uh, and survived. Um, and uh, he noticed the difference between the ones who survived and the ones who didn't. Uh, was the attitude that they took, um, and he said that the, uh, the, the that uh, the quote is that man every man has a basic freedom to choose his attitude in any given set of circumstances, and I think that uh, that is the attitude. <laughs> That is the procedure we have to encourage in all our children. You can choose your own attitude to what happens to you. You're, you're not. You don't, shouldn't think of yourself as the victim uh, of what, what happens to you. And uh, I suppose on, on here, acceptance is the, the, the particular uh, tray that goes with that. Uh, as, as regards mental illness, of course, uh, fear confusion um, is, a, is a dominant thing, whether you're, whether you're actually talking about anxiety or, or depressive conditions, both, both are, are terrifying. You don't know what's going on. Um, and uh, that it's, it's really important that people are, are able to be open about that confusion, because then what, what should happen uh, is that they see someone who can diagnose what is their actual problem. Uh, and it's remarkable how, provided it, then that then leads on to an appropriate form of treatment, how, how much relief many people get from diagnosis. Oh, my goodness. Do I have that, that thing that a million other people have um, and that somebody knows what can be done to help it? That, 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 that's a basic antidote to the fear that you absolutely rightly talk about. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to what you were talking about um, with education. Um, I'm a teacher, I work in school improvement, I work in teacher training, and a lot of what you're discussing, emotional intelligence, teaching resilience, um, caring for others, is happening and does happen and is at the forefront of a lot of schools' vision and values for their children. The issues that we face in education are the fact that that is in constant tension with the accountability and competition culture that is coming down from the DfE, not just with each other, in schools between schools in our own country, but now with schools across the world. And what I'm interested in and studying is um, how we help our teachers develop I suppose coping strategies, resilience for their own mental health and well-being, to be able to balance those two very contrasting demands on the classroom time. Um, and how you might suggest that we get to, I'm interested in your well-being and policy document and I will read that, but how we get to the policy makers. Because until we change that culture of competition and comparison that is imposes on, the, on classroom practice, 
I don't see how what everyone's working so hard to achieve can gain any more traction. I don't mean to be really pessimistic, but <laughs> that's, that's what we're struggling with. Uh, absolutely. That, that was why I, I, I mentioned that I don't think uh, it's going to be easy to change this unless we measure the well-being of children and make that an explicit objective uh, of, of schools. You know, how much well-being value added ha have they produced as well as how much learning value added have they produced. I, I even find it quite difficult myself uh, to um, get out of the habit of thinking you know, it's desperately important uh, that more people get five good GCSEs. I mean, it's, so, it's so deep in us now, but we absolutely have to uh, get out of that um, to a more humane view of what life is about and what children should be trying to do. Um, how did we get into that? I'll tell you how. It's, absolutely, it's really quite extraordinary. I mean, there, are a number of, there are a number of serious economic fallacies in what I'm about to say, as well as educational fallacies. But this is, roughly speaking, what's been around for the last 15 years. I won't name the worst offender. <laughs> One of the last three prime ministers. <laughs> But it goes like this. We are in a life and death struggle with China. We are in a life and death struggle. I mean, what? We're in a life and death struggle with China. Um, China has, is getting where it is by educating people. If we don't uh, educate more people than China, uh, we will sink beneath the waves. I mean, we will. We'll sink beneath the waves. Um, I mean, this is terrible. This is completely incorrect economics. Of course, it is still true that if you had more people uh, achieving standard uh, measures of educational success, we would have a higher G GNP. That's true. But how important is that? Uh, you, you, can com you, you, can, you can have full employment at a higher or lower level of GNP, as you can see, just by looking around the world. I'm, I'm passionately keen on full employment, but uh, that's not uh, really related uh, to any degree, strong degree to how productive uh, we are. So uh, we've got to get out of that mentality that somehow the economy comes first. You know, if you, unless the economy is right, nothing else can be right. It's not uh, simply not like that at all. Yeah, but it's coming down. You're right. It's, uh, we, we, we have to beat China. Translates into we have to get more people with five good GCSEs. Translates into we will have a league table um, so that people feel absolutely ter terrified of that. Um, translates to the head is scared. Translates to the teacher is, is scared. Translates to the children are scared. Um, we absolutely have to break it. I think we're out of time at this point. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> it's, been, it's been fascinating. Will you please uh, join me in <coughs> thanking Thank 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 Nice question. Nice question. Yeah, yeah, yeah.